If I were only given two terms to describe my reading taste, they would be Jane Austen and fantasy. This is a totally hypothetical and unlikely scenario, but the point is that I love Jane Austen and I love fantasy fiction. Almost, well, not really, I'd say about halfway maybe, to the exclusion of any other reading material. I mean, I read other stuff fairly frequently, okay? But I just always go back to Jane Austen and fantasy. Something that has always intrigued me is that while at first glance they seem completely unrelated, I often find echoes of Jane Austen in my favorite fantasy stories. It's undeniable that Austen has had a sizable impact on Western literature in general, but in fantasy in particular, and a specific brand of fantasy, I see her stamp everywhere. There's a growing subgenre of fantasy set in magical versions of Regency England, probably most famously exemplified in Susanna Clarke's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell which I admittedly have not read. It's on my TBR, I promise. But a couple of my favorite books of recent years fall into this category, namely V.E. Schwab's A Darker Shade of Magic and Zen Cho's Sorcerer to the Crown. The latter, I would say, is more Austin-y than the former, as it deals more in the comedy of manners and social commentary that Austin perfected. But both owe at least a modicum of credit to the vision of Regency England that's been perpetuated and popularized by modern readers' love for the works of Jane Austen. And to acknowledge the elephant in the room, yes, so does Bridgerton. There's one more book that falls into this fantasy version of Regency England setting, that I absolutely love. I first read it probably around age 15 or 16, which is fitting because it's YA, Sorcery in Sicilia, or The Enchanted Chocolate Pot by Patricia C. Reed and Caroline Stevimer. The narrative takes the form of letters exchanged between two cousins in England in 1817 detailing their exploits and confrontations with evil wizards. I had already read some Austen at that point, so I recognized the influence in the setting. I was also already an avid fantasy fan, with Reed's own Enchanted Forest Chronicles, one of the key works that had hooked me on the genre. The author's dedication in the book makes clear what their influences were. The author's wish to dedicate this book to Jane Austen, Georgette Heyer, J.R.R. Tolkien, and Ellen Kushner, all of whom, in their several ways, inspired us to create it. Austen and Tolkien, I knew. This wasn't too long after the release of the Lord of the Rings movies. And Heyer I eventually investigated and discovered the world of Regency romance, which I still enjoy from time to time. But Kushner is an author that I didn't really take any notice of until recently, when I dug out my old paperback copy of Sorcery and Cecilia to jog my memory for writing this post. While researching this topic, I discovered, yet again, that you really can find anything on the internet. Combining the Regency setting and or the comedy of manners of Austen's fiction with elements of fantasy fiction is something that's been happening for a long time. Manor punk is what it's often called. It's perfectly described in the Daily Dot article by Asia Romano, 
Manor Punk descends from Fantasy of Manners, a term coined by Swords Point author Ellen Kushner in 1991. The idea describes a play on comedies of manners like Much Ado About Nothing or The Importance of Being Earnest. The emphasis is on etiquette and society, chiefly, but not always, British. Basically, if you can stick Jane Austen meets X in front of your story proposal, it's got a good chance of being manor punk. We can only assume this is basically how Pride and Prejudice and Zombies came to exist. How could I have failed to mention Pride and Prejudice and Zombies until now? Of course, Seth Graham Smith's work is exemplary of the meeting of Austin and fantasy in a much more literal sense than any aforementioned works. Graham Smith's insertion of undead creatures into the nearly verbatim text of Pride and Prejudice serves as an effective, if perhaps a bit on the nose, metaphor that makes this work representative of Manor Punk's premise. The zombies are a visual manifestation of how high the stakes really are for the Bennett sisters. Marriage is literally a matter of life and death. If they don't find suitable husbands before their father passes away, they could be turned out of their house, out on the streets, they could even starve. So, in Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, the Bennett sisters are fighting for their literal survival, while in the original novel, it's not as visible, but they're still fighting for their survival. There are a few other books that take this idea of injecting monsters or magical creatures directly into Austen's stories, like the same publisher's own Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, or Mr. Darcy Vampire by Amanda Grange. Dragons, in particular, seem to find their way into Austen's world pretty frequently, such as in Maria Grace's Jane Austen's Dragons series, L. Catherine White's Heartstone, and Naomi Novik's short story Dragons and Decorum, which is set in her Temeraire universe and features Elizabeth Bennet as a ship captain with a dragon best friend. I find it interesting that dragons have so often been introduced into Austen's stories. In most of the folklore of Europe and Western Asia, dragons are usually representative of evil or the antagonist, the monster that the hero is tasked with slaying while in Chinese, Japanese, and other East Asian traditions, they're seen as symbols of light and good fortune. Austin would almost certainly have been familiar with the English legend of St. George, a knight who saved a town by slaying the dragon that was eating their sheep. In Jungian psychology and myth theory, when a hero fights a dragon, he is actually battling his own subconscious. Slaying the dragon is a vital milestone in the hero's journey and psychological development. Yet the creatures in these remixed Jane Austen novels have far more in common with the Eastern conception of a dragon than the one that St. George fought. The dragons in Heartstone and dragons in Decorum are companions and powerful allies to the human protagonists. While dragons in Western literature have, in fact, been getting friendlier for the past several decades, I think that it's worth noting the connection between the Jungian and Campbellian monomyth conception of a hero's journey cycle with dragon slaying as a main feature and the heroine's journey cycle that Austin's protagonists embark upon. As Gail Carriger has noted in her book, the hero's journey myths in which we find the dragon as an antagonist are focused on isolation and 
the solitary defeat of an enemy through violence, while the heroine's journey centers on finding or reunification with a loved one and building networks of allies and companions. If a dragon is going to be in an Austin story, a heroine's journey story, of course, it will be a friend, not a foe. In that respect, the heroine's journey and fantasy settings are a perfect fit for Austin stories. Though this may be less common, we can also see manor punk and Austin-esque elements in some science fiction. Jane Austen's novels have been retold in science fiction settings like Alexa Dunn's The Stars We Steal and Diana Pitterfriend's For Darkness Shows the Stars, both of which set persuasion in space-faring future societies. Think Treasure Planet, but with a marriage plot. And science fiction classics like Frank Herbert's Dune, or even some more recent space opera hits like Tamsin Muir's Gideon the Ninth, or John Scalzi's The Collapsing Empire, explore the ideas of societal drama and class commentary that are found in Austen's work, but in a science fiction setting. I'm also reminded of an episode of the tragically short-lived series Firefly titled Shindig, written by Jane Espenson. For those unfamiliar, the spaceship Serenity lands on a planet where one crew member, Inara, attends a ball and finds that Mal, Serenity's captain, with whom she has a will-they-or-won't-they romance throughout the show, is there too. They of course end up dancing together, and have a repartee-laced argument while sashaying across the floor. In Espenson's commentary for the episode on the DVD, she says that she was excited to write a Jane Austen scene. This remains my favorite episode of the series, for that very reason, and that very scene. And I think I have to mention the fandom phenomenon known as Regency Star Wars, a collection of fan art, cosplay, and a few fanfics that reimagine Star Wars characters and stories in a Regency or Austin-esque alternate universe and aesthetic. The Regency Ray piece by The Real McGee is probably my favorite piece of fan art ever made. I'm currently working on a cosplay inspired by it. I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to do the lightsaber and whether I'm going to need to buy a wig. I, I don't know. I mean, you can follow along on my TikTok. But let's get back to Ellen Kushner fantasy of manners, and manner punk. As noted, Kushner coined the term fantasy of manners to describe her 1991 novel Swords Point. Though I might personally use the terms interchangeably in general, in their article Romano makes a distinction between the two, though they also note the common overlap. The biggest dissonance between stories labeled fantasy of manners and stories labeled manner punk is that, as defined by early writers, fantasies of manners focus on small-scale, localized events rather than world events. But manner punk is often larger in scope. Many modern works that get dubbed manner punk do look at larger world and political events. A book such as Saucer to the Crown, for example, may accurately be termed a fantasy of manners, but it is also, by Romano's distinction, manner punk. Chapter 
because it explores the political and larger societal implications of its main character's identities. Saucer centers on Zacharias, a young black man, and Prunella, a young woman of mixed Indian and English heritage, who both face challenges, both magical and societal, due to their status in Regency England. There is a clear Austin influence in the setting, the witty dialogue, the romance, and the comedy of manners, but this is a world that's much bigger than the one Austin typically wrote about. Manor punk is a welcoming genre for characters with identities that would traditionally be othered, stereotyped, or simply absent in a more typical historical fiction or even fantasy setting. Whether with characters of color like in Saucer to the Crown, or with LGBTQ characters like in Gideon the Ninth and that original fantasy of manners, Swords Point, or characters with intersections of these identities, like in Zencho's sequel to Sorcerer, The True Queen. The genre is apt for both inclusion of these identities and exploration of the interaction of personal identity with social identity and class. The core element of a manor punk setting is a very stratified society with strict rules and customs. With the introduction of magic or the other fantastical elements pushing against the boundaries of that society. In speculative fiction that is less concerned with the fantastical magic of another world or the technological wonders of the future, less focused on the wars and grand scale politics than on how the wars, politics, and magic or technology affect the characters and the interpersonal relationships between human beings or dragons or androids, I find the best of what is so intriguing to me about these genres. When science fiction and fantasy are at their best, they explore the meaning of humanity questions of human nature in ways in which realistic or contemporary fiction is often unable, at least with the same clarity and nuance. Jane Austen wrote exclusively about the very small world that she inhabited, and probably would have never imagined that dragons, zombies, and spaceships would be added to her stories in future centuries. War and politics were always off-screen. On the surface, her books are about balls and parties and who's going to marry whom. But at their heart, Jane Austen's books are about human nature. Just like with the core intentions of Manor Punk, Jane Austen's works subtly pushed against the boundaries of the society in which she lived. We can see in her heroines the unnamed struggle against the patriarchy and the quiet rebellion against the strictures that Regency England placed on women. Like the best speculative fiction authors, and the best fiction authors in general, Austen was concerned with presenting characters that feel real and sympathetic with telling stories that serve those characters' desires and motivations. And most of all, with writing books in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humor are conveyed to the world in the best 
chosen language. That's all I have ever wanted in a book. Also, Mr. Darcy Vampire is just as ridiculous as it sounds, but I love it and you should definitely read it. Thank you so much for watching. This is the first video essay I've ever made, so let me know what you think and I may be persuaded to make more. I am currently planning a vlog series called Pride and Prejudice and Pastry, wherein I will be rereading and discussing Pride and Prejudice and attempting to bake all 12 recipes in the Pride and Prejudice cookbook along the way. So if you are interested in seeing that, feel free to subscribe. You can also find me on social media and other places around the internet. All of my stuff is linked in the description below. Thank you so much to Virtual Jane Con for including me in this event. If you missed any of the panels or premieres, check out their YouTube channel for a full playlist of this year's program. Because who doesn't want more Jane Austen in their lives? Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.